Good morning to everyone and welcome to the webinar of the Community of Practice for the Support of National Adaptation Plans to, for Climate Change. Um, I would like to start uh, first with the question whether you hear me all right. If you could please let me know in the chat on your right side of the screen. All right, perfect. So, great. Um, my name is Lili Ilieva. I will be moderating the webinar. For those of you who have uh, not used the voice box platform, um, you can choose the language to listen. Uh, and you can see it um, in the bottom right of your screen where you see choose your language. You may choose in, to listen to the webinar in Spanish or in English. If you have any technical problem, please don't hesitate to click on the question mark in the lower left corner of the screen. There we have a technical support uh, who would try to help you with uh, any problem you may have. As well, if your screen frozes or uh, audio is cutting off, please try to refresh the, pa the page. So, once again, welcome to everyone. First um, of all, I would like to present you uh, the Community of Practice on National Adaptation Plans. It is an initiative of the UN Environment through their program, REGATA, the Regional Portal of Technology Transfer and Action Against Climate Change. The initiative is being implemented in collaboration with Practical Action. The NAPS community offers the public officials involved in the elaboration of national adaptation plans in countries in Latin America and the Caribbean the opportunity to support each other through exchange of good practices, challenges in their work, and also receive input um, from researchers and specialists uh, in international cooperation and civil society. So this uh, exchange is done through the knowledge, uh, knowledge portal and as well through moderated discussions and se a series of webinars as this one. The topic of today's webinar is access to international financing for national adaptation plans. Uh, why do we, why, why financing is such a key word in national adaptation plans development and implementation? It is, of course, needed. It is needed throughout the entire process in order to enable its potential to be reached. This means from the initiation of the national adaptation plans development process to its implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of the adaptation actions which have been prioritized Um, so developing countries can access a range of finance sources to support the national adaptation plans process and thereby contribute to the achievement of adaptation of their adaptation um, needs. At the general level, there are different um, sources for financing and they can be classified uh, in terms of whether they are domestic, international, public or private. And it is a key challenge for countries um, to determine how to best combine these different sources and meet their financial needs. Well, um, taking in consideration their national capacities and circumstances. So with this in mind, um, it is our pleasure to share with you uh, experiences from the Caribbean region, especially um, in regards to the access to international finance for national adaptation plans. We have the great pleasure to, to have as guests Dr. Marc Binoe, an Assistant Executive Director and Head of the Program Development and Man Management Unit of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, and Ruth Spencer, a coordinator for the Antigua and Barbuda Global Environment Facility Small Grants Program, as well member of the GEF Technical Assistance Committee. So, um, Mark Binoe would uh, tell us more about building resilience to climate variability and change um, and the regional approach to funding national adaptation plans. 
I see that some of the participants yes, um, are having some problems with the audio. So please, if you could refresh your website um, or search support in the, with our technical support um, where you see the question mark on the left side, down side of the screen. Um, well, it is my pleasure to, to give the word to Dr. Mark Binoe. Just uh, one moment in order to connect. Okay, thank you and good morning again to everyone. Um, I first would like to express our solidarity and heartfelt um, some, I don't want to say grief, but disturbances was taking place in the Eastern Caribbean, particularly the islands of Barbuda and Antigua. And we stand also in solidarity with our other CARICOM member states who would have been impacted by Hurricane Orma and continue to keep them in our thoughts and prayers, knowing what's still to come with Jose and others. So I think this webinar is most opportune at this particular point in time, given the whole discussion we're having with regards to national adaptation planning. But it does put in context that there is a certain um, threshold or a certain limit to our adaptation plans. And we need to still be focusing as a priority the whole issue of how we're going to move towards also mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Having said that, I'll briefly provide you an overview with regards to where we are as the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, which is an entity within the CARICOM region that has been mandated to provide or to coordinate the climate change response within our various sister countries. To do this, we have basically developed a regional strategy and its accompanying implementation plan. Um, the regional strategy went through an intensive period of consultation with the various countries, as, and within those countries, we focused on governments, opposition leaders, and opposition parties, the private sector, civil society, academia, um, um, faith-based organizations, and a whole range of other stakeholders so that we got the buy-in. This strategy was approved by our heads of government in 2009, and it is currently going, undergoing some revision. The accompanying, it sets out basically five thematic areas. One focuses on mainstreaming climate change into sustainable development agenda. The second looks at promoting systems and actions to reduce the vulnerability of the Caribbean community. The third is to promote measures to derive benefit from prudent forest management, particularly within the scope of, of, of Red Plus. Uh, the fourth looks at promotion of actions and arrangements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So all actions pertaining to our NDCs would largely fall within the scope of thematic area number four insofar as they are focused on energy with um, fossil fuel reduction, energy efficiency me mechanisms, and how we can basically move towards a more um, um, low-carbon low economy. And the fifth basically focuses on adaptation measures. So much of what we will be discussing today sits nicely within uh, many of these thematic areas as identified, but particularly thematic area number five. The implementation plan that accompanies the strategy 
which runs until 2021, was approved in 2012, and it basically seeks to, to outline the issues and how they will be addressed, bringing on board various funding agencies and partners, as many would have identified. We are not just focused on public sector financing, we're also looking to bring the private sector in, in, into play, as well as to work towards what we see as de-risking the region. Now, having said that, our discussion or our focus on the whole issue of adaptation planning begs the question, why adaptation plans? And largely provide a comprehensive approach towards building resilience to climate change. And they offer us a blueprint for addressing climate change within nation states. So while it is true, there are multiplicity of potential funding sources, the idea is not to narrow ourselves or to move towards a piecemeal approach, but to have a comprehensive approach in terms of seeking to build resilience to climate variability and change. The results areas for our NAPs seeking funding are basically divided into two broad groups, mitigation, which is reducing emissions, and adaptation, which seeks to build resilience. Under the mitigation umbrella, the focus is largely on energy generation and access. How do we build more um, um, fuel efficient transportation sector? Greater resilience in terms of buildings, cities, and industries and appliances. And last but not least, forest and land use, which you would have remembered, one of the areas we also identified within our regional strategy. On the day, rubric of adaptation, where we're focusing on increasing resilience, simply because we recognize that our carbon footprint is so minuscule and we will have little impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We look at livelihoods of people and communities, and I think the current um, state of affairs puts this beautifully in context. The kind of infrastructure and built environment in terms of enhancing the capacity to withstand certain tropical storms, but once you get a one in 500 year event or a category five hurricane followed up by subsequent hurricanes, it is going to take a significant toll on any of our island states. Health, food, and water security. So we are seeing new challenges emerging, like within the scope of Zika um, and other such diseases that are now popping up. Food and water security remains critical for us because our food import bill is substantial. Um, we import on average about $5 billion annually into the region. And water security because eight of the 14 CARICOM states have been identified by the World Resources Institute as being severely water scarce and eight out of the 32 most water scarce islands are found within the Caribbean. And last but not least, ecosystems and ecosystem services. Again, primarily because we recognize that in terms of building resilience and working with the environment, ecosystem-based adaptation remains a very attractive option. It is fairly low cost as well as it seeks to bring back the resilience into systems that will help protect most of our coastlands where 60% of our population resides. Funding, therefore, comes under different, under the convention, and I'm speaking here of the UNFCCC Convention. We can be supported under the Least Development Developed Countries Fund, which is a fund that is supported largely by the Global Environmental Facility, or 
the Special Climate Change Fund, again supported by Jeff. Um, also, we have the Adaptation Fund, which is still functioning, but is supposed to be grandfathered into the Green Climate Fund, which is that fund that is merely formulated and came on stream to address the kinds of climate change challenges that we face. But these are just some of the more, what should I say, conventional funds that exist. It doesn't preclude us from working with other bilateral and multilateral donors, inclusive of entities like your um, Inter-American Development Bank, your World Bank, and like-minded partners such as uh, UK DFID, uh, RCID, USAID, and other such partners, as well as in including the private sector wherever the opportunities arise, as well as where business case can be made. So it's always the contention, now that we have the, the plan, how are we going to implement this plan? Um, what this schematic basically gives to us is the, pr the procedure for program identification for the least developed country fund projects. And it gives us a clear idea in terms of we start with the submission of the PIF by, the L by, by, by a specific country. That will then have a decision made by the Jeff Secretariat it will be posted on the PIF website in terms of what it is, whether they going forward or not. Review of the PIF by the LC, LDCF or the SCCF Council, which is the low, least developed country fund or the, or the, 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 the others. So they help us to determine whether or not this is something that we want to go forward with. But, this is just, as I said, one of the modalities available to us, and it doesn't mean that we have to stick to this particular fund. We can also be applying to the GCF, which we'll come to in a minute, or we can go to the Adaptation Fund, or, as I said earlier, we can work through bilateral arrangements. Or, last but not least, we can also work through um, arrangements with the, the private sector, or other such entities. Funding for NAPS under the GCF modalities as we have found, the first of all, they must be aligned with the GCF results management framework. And those will include sectors such as health, food and water security, the livelihoods of people and communities, infrastructure and built environment, ecosystems and ecosystem services. And at the 13th meeting of the GCF, it approved up to 3 million per country for readiness and proprietary support programs. Now, I think Ruth is going to speak to that in a couple of minutes, but Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, and Guyana are three countries which have been moving to develop their um, NAP with support from different partners. I know Antigua has made an application, and I think she was the first country to have received funds in the Caribbean for her NAP support. Grenada, NAP is fairly well advanced, and I know Guyana is just about starting, and she's expected to receive assistance on the United Nations environment. Um, this is to formulate national programs and other adaptation planning processes and for institutional capacity strengthening. Now, the modalities for accessing financial support resources through the GCF can be through established and maintaining a national designated authority or focal point, as many of our countries are now moving to do, identifying and seeking accreditation as Antigua is currently doing. She has been accredited to the Adaptation Fund, but she's now seeking accreditation to the GCF, and so she's using that opportunity to access these funds. Or you can work through an accredited entity. Uh, in the Caribbean, we have two such entities in the Climate Change Center, which I represent, as well as the Caribbean Development Bank. And both have been accredited to the small um, risk category, but unlike the CDB who can on lend, our program is largely a grant program, and so we are able to 
apply for funding of between 10 to 50 million US dollars per project, or we can work with you to access the $3 million for your adaptation planning programs. Um, moving towards the GCF, as I said, we have been accredited. We're accredited in 2015. Our risk category is B, so we cannot fund any major infrastructural projects. Um, we have the basic fiduciary standard for granting and ungranting, and we signed the accreditation master agreement in May of 2016. Um, we're working with countries so that they can be ready to access GCF funding directly and have more country ownership. For example, we are assisting Guyana in her NDA strengthening program. We're also working with Belize and the Bahamas, and we have received an approach also from the government of St. Lucia. Um, we must ensure, however, that whatever we do, they have proper environmental and social safeguards, there are good gender policies in place, the fiduciary policies and oversight arrangements are wholesome and will stand up to scrutiny, and there is strong stakeholder consultation going forward. Um, we are also assisting countries in accessing project preparation grants to actualize or elaborate their funding proposals, and the, last, the next couple of slides will speak to this in a general way. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't only have to concentrate on funding via the GCF. This slide basically gives an overview of some of the partnerships we have had, helping countries once you have your NAP to basically see where the car will be for a specific um, donor. So, like for example, we've been working with the UK DFID, we've worked with the IDB, uh, the, U the EU. CCA, that's the European Union Global Climate Change Alliance, uh, CDKN, Climate Development Knowledge Network, FWO, the German government, uh, the government of Italy, United States government, as well as the Caribbean Development Bank. So that's how we have gone about seeking to ensure that we will find the necessary resources because in all fairness, I think it's unfair to expect any single donor to be able to fund an entire NAP, given that we are representing 14 countries. So what we're looking for is greater coordination and synchronization with our programs. Um, we are implementing these through partnership arrangements, so we work through countries, but also a number of regional organizations, inclusive of the Caribbean Public Health Agency, Caribbean Disaster and Emergency Management Agency, Institute of Meteorology of Cuba, University of Guyana, University of Belize, University of the West Indies, the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology, the Caribbean Agricultural Research Development Institute, and this is just a snapshot of some. This doesn't cover the whole gamut of entities with which we work to implement the, the various NAP programs, and we follow the three Ps. We believe that we, work, we must first have policies, we work with people, and we work through partnerships. Um, currently, and the proposed engagement with the GCF basically looks at NDA support, which is, as I said, 22%, bilateral support, 21%, and I'll show you what these mean in the next slide. Um, so, at bilateral programs, we are just about to submit a project for the Barbados government. We are working on one on energy and energy efficiency with the government of Belize. Um, one on water, water security and water resilience building for the government of, of Grenada. And another water security project for the government of Dominica. And you would notice that three out of the four focusing focuses heavily on water and water security. And this is not by accident. 
It's because of the challenges which our countries face with more extreme weather events and a warming of the climate. At the multi-country level, um, we have a coral reef resilience and restoration project which we are currently working on. And this will be for Jamaica, Belize, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Dominican Republic. Um, there is another which looks at enhancing resilience in the fishery sector. And again, you can see the countries which are involved. And last but not least, one that seeks to enhance coastal resilience. And again, you notice the countries that are involved. This last project will act like a small grants project and the countries will have the eligibility of applying to help advance their own NAPS program. Um, I'm nearing the end, so just bear with me a few more minutes. And then we have the project preparation grant support, which we are going for. So of those that I showed you, um, we have five of those that we're going for project preparation grant support. So this will help us to elaborate the project concept, develop the, the funding proposal, ensure that the various studies are completed, such as your environmental impact assessments, your uh, gender study, your stakeholder consultation, and so forth. So that basically is my presentation, and I'll be open for any questions, but thank you again for listening, and I hope I have captured in a very succinct way what we're doing in the Caribbean, not only in terms of, of our NAPS program, but building resilience more holistically to deal with the threats posed by climate change. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for giving us the, an overview and the horizon of the, the Caribbean Community Climate, uh, Climate Change Center with regards to opportunities um, and steps that have been taken to access um, financial um, means for development and supporting national adaptation plans. Um, well, at, at this uh, moment, um, I would like to share with you that our next uh, presenter, Ruth Spencer from Antigua and Barbuda, um, will, will follow up with the presentation. Um, first of all, to express uh, our solidarity uh, with what is uh, being happening in Antigua and Barbuda and in the, in the Caribbean region at the moment. Um, I will follow up with her presentation as um, the connection uh, is uh, not so stable, and then we would, uh, the, the internet connection, and so we would follow up with a session of questions and uh, answers after her presentation. So, um, Ruth, I will give you um, the word now. Antigua, I don't know if you're hearing me well because the only place I could get some internet connection was at the airport. Are you hearing me? Okay. We have reached where we are in Antigua as a result of an intersectorial relationship existing between government agencies, private sector, NGOs, local communities, groups. We have come together to work toward a common vision of getting our NAPS done. The NAPS requires a lot of information, a lot of data, lots of studies, but the information is available among key government departments and also among some of our NGOs. So we have an interministerial committee that meets every month. We have been meeting for over three years, and this is the way we form bonds and linkages. I get to know people, people get to know me, so we know each other, not only by name, but face to face, and we are able to build professional and personal relationships that enable us to get the job done here in Antigua. Next slide.
Hello everyone once again. I would like to apologize for the connection um, we have with uh, Ruth Spencer. Um, we would uh, wait for her to reconnect um, once again to follow up with the presentation, um, yet understanding the situation um, right now in Antigua and Barbuda. Um, let's hope it would be possible. Um, meanwhile, um, please um, think about any questions you might have um, for the presentation um, of Dr. Mark Binoe. And uh, you may write your questions uh, in the chat channel on the right side of the screen. So we can have a, a discussion um, about the experience uh, which Mark shared with us. Thank you. I would like also to share with uh, all of you that um, the, pres the webinar is being recorded and we would share with you the recording as well as the presentations. I see once again that uh, Ruth uh, has managed to connect. Uh, Ruth, do you hear me? Uh, and well, yes, so the connection is not so stable with her. So please, I invite you to share um, any questions um, for Dr. Mark Binoe. I see um, that uh, Ruth Spencer has connected once again, so I would um, give her the word to follow up with the presentation. Um, the floor is yours, Ruth. Thank you. Protection and Management Bill. We passed the Environment Protection and Management Bill. And everyone has to be committed. Thank you. Oh, I Much, Ruth. Um, thank you for the efforts to connect and to be present at our, at our webinar. It really means a lot to hear from you. Um, the challenges that Antigua and Barbuda is experiencing and the opportunities it has in, with regards to assessing um, funds for development of the National Adaptation Plans. Thank you once again. Um, it was a very interesting inputs uh, both from Mark and from Ruth uh, with regards to what um, a, a key point um, in approaching uh, financing or international financing specifically um, is the engagement, engagement with different stakeholders, engagement um, in different partnerships. Um, so at, uh, at this point I would like to to give the chance for the participants to to write their questions, uh, both for for Dr. Marbino and for Ms. Ruth Spencer. Uh, we know it uh, it is a very challenging time uh, right now in the Caribbean region, and we are very thankful for their assistance and willingness to share with us their experience.
you, you may write your questions um, in the chat. So I see a question from SR, um, especially for Ruth. Um, the question is, Antigua and Barbuda seems uh, two way ahead of other Caribbean islands in terms of securing financing for NAPS. Uh, what are you doing that others are not? Um, I would uh, give the word to Ruth um, to answer the question. the question um, for Ruth Spencer. Uh, Antigua and Barbuda seems uh, to be way ahead of other Caribbean islands in terms of securing financing for NAPS. Um, what uh, are you doing that others are not? Um, I, I give the floor to Ruth to answer to this question. said I work with the NGO groups and I'm included in every email, in every discussion, so I galvanize the efforts of the NGOs to have inputs. We have our own meetings, we have conference rooms where they make a sacrifice, leave their activities in their communities and come and provide input. And I think this networking is what is pushing ahead. We all know, we, we all have common information working towards this common goal and it benefits us because our communities get included we can get funding for projects and it builds our emotional and moral commitment to the processes and we are proactive much Ruth um, for the for responding to the question um, we have received two questions um, for Dr. Malbinoe one comes from from Olivia Palin the question is uh, you mentioned that there is need for greater coordination in funding of the region's NAPs. Uh, does the five C's have any recommendations on how the extent to which international funders and the private sector could or should be involved in the development of uh, national adaptation plans? And another question from Tatiana Almeida uh, is does the NDA need to be, to be from the government? Is it um, possible to be a private company with an environmental focus or a civic organization as an NGO? Um, thank you both for the questions. I would give the word to Dr. Mark Binoe to give his response. Okay, thanks again. To address Olivia's question first, um, within the whole focus of developing the NAPS, I think it is one thing for us to have a beautiful document. It's another thing for us to know where the funding is coming from. So yes, I would say at the very inception of the development process, the involvement of all requisite stakeholders of which the donor community and the private sector must be seen as key partners in all of this would be important because ultimately we're looking for resources to actualize these plans and to make them implementable. So. The, the recommendation I would have is to involve them at the very inception of our discussion on the, on the NAP development process. Um, uh, another recommendation I would have is that going through that process now, when the process is completed, let us use our NAPs as the, one of the, the, the modalities for resource mobilization. We do know that donor partners in particular may have specific interests 
But as far as possible, we have to define what are our interests to ensure that we are indeed building a complete bridge and not have many half bridges undone. To address the question raised by Jacqueline, um, yes, that, that will have to be something which the private sector and the country or NGO and the country will have to decide upon. So for example, we have seen NGOs, international NGOs accredited to the GCF, such as Conservation International. Um, so there is nothing wrong with uh, a, a private sector and NGO entity being accredited, but that has to be in keeping with your national NDA supporting that process. And whatever that entity does subsequently is endorsed by the national NDA so that there is coherence in the development process going forward. What you don't want is a particular entity going off to do their own thing, and it's not in consonance with what the country may want or is striving towards. Thank you very much, Dr. Binoe, for um, responding to the questions. If we have uh, some other questions on behalf of the public, please, um, uh, you may write them down. Meanwhile, um, I, do not, I do not see any additional questions, uh, and I would like to give the chance uh, once again to to Ruth Spencer and to Dr. Marbinoe to to give their um, let's say la um, key messages uh, to us. Um, so I would give uh, yes, I would give the word to um, Ruth Spencer. Thank you, Ruth. As you know, Antigua is a small country, and when you are small, you do good, the word gets around, and you have people, groups, agency trying to find you, trying to network with you, trying to build bonds with you, and so the linkages become stronger, your, your following, your gathering gets stronger, and you're able to push to get things done. Our government is very supportive. Our cabinet, everything that we need to put in place, all the legislation, we have good support from the Attorney General's office to get the draft regulations in place. Uh, Mrs. Diane Blacklane, our ambassador for climate change, she goes to the cabinet, she shares her vision for the country. And because this Department of Environment has able, been able to access this large amount of grant funding to enable us to meet our challenges, right now we have so much rains coming, we are putting in bigger pipelines, bigger drains so the water can flow and stop flooding people's you know, homes and communities. So the country is able to see the effects of our work. We are seeing results. And the more we see results, the more we want to give, the more we want to commit our time, our energy and resources. But if you leave people out of the processes, you don't have that local buy-in, you don't have that strong stakeholder coming together. But in Antigua, we have seen results, we share, we participate, we give our commitments, and we see things come that are able to benefit the communities. They are involved in implementing the projects. You have to remember, a government agency can produce a policy, but who is going to implement? And if these people don't have that buy-in from the inception, that early stage is very important. Another thing that's very important consultations, we can't just plan them any and anywhere. We have to find the right time. You have to remember you want the women, the men, the children, the youth to be involved. So the timelines when you plan these things are very important. It has to fit in with the schedules. And we have to announce them well in advance. And we use whatever medium is best. If we have to go to the church and make the announcements, we use the church. 
if we have to put a fly in a community center, we put the flyer, but we want the strong engagement. This is what drives the process. And I'm very excited with the work in Antigua and what I'm doing and the network, the strong networks that we have. And our future looks very, very good because we're working together. And this is what we want, a country going forward with the key stakeholders involved pushing the process. And, you know, I can share more with people. You know, you can have my email, my presentation, and, you know, we can get things done. So thanks for having me, and I'm sorry about the bad internet connection. Truth for the very motivating message and um, for expressing really this wish of working together with everyone. Um, in order to achieve the goals and Antigua and Barbuda is uh, really an impressive example of how it may work. So thank you once again, thank you for the effort to be with us um, and we are with you. Um, the internet connection was good um, and we're very happy uh, that you were able to participate in the webinar. Um, I would give the, um, the word now as well to Dr. Mark Binoe to also um, share with us um, the, um, final comments and, and key messages. Uh, thank you, Mark. I see there was a, a question that was already answered um, uh, from Luis Felipe um, Calturano. Um, so we, we can follow up with some key words and messages uh, from Dr. Mark Bino. Thank you very much. And I want to first of all endorse every word you mentioned as well as that of Ruth. I want to also personally thank her for making the effort going through what they have just gone through and yet to leave her home to find a space in the airport so that she can fulfill her, her commitment to this cause is indeed commendable. Um, we from the 5Cs would like to continue to endorse what she said and it's all about us having a Collabor a collaborative approach and greater levels of coordination in seeking to develop the NAPs. I see someone asks, why is it Antigua is so far ahead? Antigua is far ahead for multiplicity of reasons, inclusive of the fact that Antigua started their process earlier. Um, they have a bit more resources than some of the other islands, as well as they have been more connected, I would say, I don't want to speak out the term, but more connected with regards to taking back from the various conventions what it is they should be doing. And so I think with a champion like Ambassador Black Lane, who needs to be given lots of kudos, um, they have been able to move the processes forward within Anti. A number of the other countries are now catching up, but what is important is that they can learn from Antigua's experiences. They can learn from what others have done so that we do not have to reinvent the proverbial wheel. Um, what I would like to emphasize, and as my last closing point, is that let us not just be content in having a NAPS process carry through and a NAPS program um, document develop. Let's also think about how it will ultimately be implemented because what we have noticed a lot in the Caribbean is that we have many, many documents, but the implementation is often lacking. And we do not want the NAPs to be seen in a similar process. Let us ensure that ultimately we're able to carry this forward and where possible that it is indeed seeking to build the resilience of our people. Just before I go, I see I have a, another question from Louis Philippe. Um, where can I find information on accreditation requirements and how to start the process? You have the GCF website, for example, www.gcf.org. There is the Adaptation Fund website, and these will give you pretty detailed outlines. If not, you can follow up with me, and I'd be more than willing to provide any additional information. So I will just stop here, and thanks once again for listening to me. I know it wasn't always easy understanding my dialect. But thanks again, and thanks to those who gave us the opportunity to present on what's happening in the Caribbean.
Well, thank you for your uh, key messages. Thank you for the inspiring um, um, message you give us. Uh, and I see as well um, just um, that Ruth Spencer would like to um, share something additional. So I would uh, give her the word uh, once again. Uh, thank you, Ruth. to share that Antigua is the first Caribbean government to be accredited to the Adaptation Fund. And we got good news that at the October board meeting, we will be offered accreditation with the Green Climate Fund. As an NGO person, I have been in all the Skype discussions. And one thing they keep asking the people from the GCF, being accredited, what does that do for your local community group? So I'm able to share on the various processes of engagement and um, we have um, unfortunately just noticed uh, that um, the connection of a route um, has fallen down um, and unfortunately she was not able to um, finish her her talk um, I would uh, certainly sh we would share with you all the um, um, the, the contacts uh, both of uh, Ruth Spencer and Dr. Binoe uh, if you may uh, want to have any uh, additional questions I see that uh, there is uh, one additional question um, from uh, Nancy Gabriela, uh, which is uh, directed to Dr. Mark, um, and uh, says that the organization where they work on the prog program to adapt to climate change in protected natural areas um, in Tabasco, in Mexico, in the end we will present an investment portfolio for the resilience of regions. Uh, we can obtain, where can we obtain more information to improve the, the process? Um, I understand it uh, at the, on the page of uh, the Green Climate Fund. Um, there is um, a clear explanation, as also uh, Dr. Binoe mentioned, about the necessary steps to be taken with regards to the um, to the process for presenting uh, proposals. So, um, thank you very much. Um, I would um, have a try to to give the floor to um, Ruth Spencer once again, so she will be able to finish her message. Sorry for the ups and downs with the internet. I'm actually at the airport. That's the only place I could get some internet, but I really wanted to share with the group. But asking for assistance with their naps, and however I can assist, I will. Thank you very much. Hi. I'll call you. I'm on a Skype meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. Um, we are as well as um, part of the community of practice on national adaptation plans. Uh, we'll share with you more information um, when it is needed um, with regards to the process for uh, application to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, with this, as um, well, as Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Bino and uh, Ruth Spencer mentioned that there are, well, there is a, a, an area of uh, financing available to support NAP processes and it is uh, crucial to align financial needs uh, in order to kind of respond to the most appropriate, uh, or to, to seek the most appropriate sources and meet those needs. So the development of um, kind of a financial strategy for national adaptation processes and engagement from the very beginning with all relevant stakeholders um, is key for these processes. Um, thank you very much once again to our guests, Dr. Mark Binoe and Ms. Ruth Spencer. Um, it was really a pleasure for us to have your um, insights and uh, experience shared uh, with us. Um, uh, 
Um, and um, I would follow up as well on behalf of uh, UN Environment and Regatta Program. Thank you very much for assisting to the webinar. We will follow up with um, additional um, series of webinars on um, private sector financing for NAPS and as well domestic uh, financing opportunities for development and implementation of NAPS. So we would um, share with you the, the dates for those presentation for those webinars. And we would share with you the recording and the presentations um, of this of this webinar. Thank you very much. Once again, um, we um, support all the countries in the Caribbean region. Uh, we hope uh, it is a very difficult moment, uh, be, but we believe um, that people are strong to survive um, such challenging um, times. Thank you once again and um, have a good day. Goodbye.